Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Meet the Analyst webinar, Non-Endemic Advertising, Understanding Its Growing Influence in Retail Media. I'm Jeremy Goldman, Senior Director of Content Briefings at eMarketer, coming to you live from our New York City headquarters. And I'm joined right now with my colleague, Principal Analyst, Sarah Marzano. Hey, Sarah, great to have you. Hi, Jeremy, I'm excited to be here. I'm really excited for your presentation. I know we all are, and I'd like to thank Sky for making today's webinar possible. And welcome Megan Harbold, Vice President of Product Marketing at Sky. Megan is joining us from Seattle. Hey, Megan. Hey, Jeremy, wonderful to be here. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, a few things before we dive in. We have a ton of information to share, but there's no need to take notes. We will be emailing you a link with the slides and recording after today's presentation. Uh, we would, however, love for you to engage with us in the chat throughout the show to hear your thoughts on non-endemic ads and add any questions you might have. So just use the chat window on the right of your screen to submit questions at any time during the presentation. We will get to as many as we can during our live Q&A later on. So with that, Sarah, let's get started. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we're going to spend the next 15 to 20 minutes talking about one of uh, what I think is the most interesting trends emerging in retail media today, and non-endemic advertising. Before we get started, I just want to give an idea of the structure of today's conversation. We're going to kick off with a brief overview of retail media's trajectory. That'll give us a foundation for understanding the monumental growth we expect within this ad channel that's really underpinning a lot of the emerging trends we're watching in retail media today, including non-endemic advertising. We'll then spend some time diving into the definition of non-endemic advertising, what it is, what it isn't, and uh, what it looks like in practice and how it's unfolding within the industry. Then we'll uh, take a high level look at some of the trends that are behind the momentum that is driving growth within non-endemic advertising for retail media. And we'll close out with some takeaways for retail media networks and advertisers who may be mulling over this opportunity. Before we get started, I wanna clarify that when we say retail media, we're describing digital advertising that appears on a retailer's on-premise signage. So either in their physical stores or in the immediately adjacent exterior, digital advertising that shows on retailers' websites or apps, or that's bought through a retailer's media network or demand side platform leveraging that retailer's first party data to target their customers off-site and across the open web. Taking a look at eMarketer's US ad spending forecast for retail media, you'll see that we anticipate ad spend within this channel to come in above $54 billion this year. Looking out through our forecast period, which goes through 2028, we expect ad spend to grow by more than double. In 2028, we'll be looking at a channel that represents nearly $130, $130 billion in ad spending. What I think brings us into sharper focus, though, is examining retail media ad spend against the context of total media ad spend. In 2024, retail media makes up about 14% of all the dollars allocated to media. By 2028, we'll be looking at an ad channel that represents nearly one out of every $4 spent on media. I think looking at this big picture view is important because it makes it clear that retail media is no longer a burgeoning category in its niche kind of co co corner of digital advertising. Instead, it's an ad channel that has the power to really reshape the way we look at media. Before we dive into non-endemic advertising, I want to clarify that the majority of volume uh, behind retail media ad spend, as well as the growth, is going to be driven by advertisers who are promoting products and brands that are directly for sale at the retailer where that ad inventory is listed. I clarify this because when we talk about non-endemic advertising, we're actually describing the practice of retail media networks selling ad inventory to advertisers who are promoting brands, products, or services that aren't directly sold by that retailer. Similar to traditional retail media, ad inventory allocated to non-endemic advertisers can be featured on retailers' digital-owned and operated properties, so on their website or their app, 
in their physical owned and operated properties, like their physical stores, or leverage that retailer's first party customer data to reach their consumers wherever they're spending time off site and across the open web. So let's take a look at what that looks like in practice. Uh, in this example, we're looking at a retail that carries a multi-category assortment, which includes health and personal care, food and beverage, and apparel, shoes, and accessories. This retailer's media network is going to be primarily funded by investments from endemic advertisers who are promoting products that customers can buy while they're shopping with that retailer either off of their digital shelf while shopping online or off the, their physical shelf when they're shopping in stores. Non-endemic advertisers can come from adjacent but complementary categories. In this example, we're thinking through cars, furniture, or home improvement. Categories that aren't sold by this retailer that don't run the risk of cannibalizing this retailer's direct sales, but who presumably this retailer's audience have purchased in the past and may be showing behavior that indicates they're in the market for in the future. Non-endemic advertisers can also come from complementary industries or services. So consider the travel industry, financial services, or media and entertainment. All industries that may have an interest in the particular demographic makeup of a retailer's audience and have a vested interest in reaching that retailer's audience while they're in a shopping mindset. When we take a look at how this is unfolding across the retail landscape, this is just a quick scan of headlines looking at retail media going back a few years. We can see that retailers from every corner of the retail landscape are exploring ways to incorporate non-endemic advertising into their retail media strategy. This is just a select view at some of the announcements that we've seen, uh, but you can see everyone from traditional department stores to grocers, big box and specialty retailers starting to think through how non-endemic advertising can support their overall retail media strategy. Taking a look at this from another angle, something that stood out to us when we were looking into the trend of non-endemic advertising is that a playbook is starting to emerge, which is really impacting the time that passes between a retailer launching their media network and officially kind of incorporating non-endemic advertising. So we'll start by looking at Amazon and Walmart two early movers within the retail media space who command about 80% share of the ad spending within this channel. For each of these retailers, about 10 years went by between when they launched their media network and when they officially announced moving into non-endemic advertising. Amazon at their unboxed conference in 2022, marking the official rollout of their non-endemic offering, and Walmart, who have made several announcements this year. The first in April 2024, when they made select non-endemic advertisers eligible to purchase display advertising through Walmart's retail media network. And then more recently, uh, when it was announced that Walmart was looking into bringing non-endemic advertisers into their physical stores. Taking a look at some of the announcements that we've seen since then, one trend became clear, which is that less time is passing between when retailers are launching their media networks and their announcement of exploring the non-endemic space. This is, Sarah, I, I would just say this is, I think, really interesting. I'm wondering why you think that is, because couldn't it just be that there's, you know, you're playing catch up at this point if you're launching uh, your retail media network later than everybody else and you know that there's a chasm between the Amazons of the world and the GoPuffs, and they have to play catch up. Yeah, no, I think there's a myriad of reasons. We'll get into some of the trends that are sort of broadly driving momentum. Uh, one consideration is that there's something to be said for the second mover advantage, right? Letting those who have come before you do the work of investigating what opportunities they are and kind of pressure testing them with the market. But I think something else to consider um, is the variety of reasons why uh, different types of retailers might be motivated uh, to look into non-endemic advertising uh, as part of their growth strategy. So you could consider a retailer with a very mature, well-developed media network who's recognizing how well-optimized they are among their endemic advertisers, but is looking for ways to future-proof their growth trajectory. Non-endemic advertising is just one of several strategies they might be looking into in order to secure that incremental growth. 
I think for many small and mid-sized retailers, they're recognizing a bit quicker how competitive the landscape is, particularly if they're looking to court ad dollars from commodity categories who have no shortage of retailers to invest with. And then the last thing I'll mention is uh, specialty retailers who maybe have more narrow product assortments and fewer endemic advertisers to choose from in the first place, but may be able to tout a value proposition of a close relationship with a really specialized audience that holds a lot of appeal for non-endemic advertisers. So I think for retailers, it's the second mover advantage and all of that myriad of reasons why non-endemic advertising may be an appealing way to expand their retail media network. I think what this data shows us is that non-endemic advertising is moving from being a, a niche experimental offering into more of a standard part of a retailer's solutions and capabilities. Before we move on to the next section, I think one thing that's unique about non-endemic advertising is that the advertisers retailers work with need to be selected with a lot of careful consideration. Um, as ever in retail, it's very important to put your consumer and your shopper first and consider how this new experience may impact them. Some best practices include ensuring that the non-endemic advertisers a retailer partners with feel complimentary. So audiences on both sides need to be evaluated for overlap, looking for things like commonalities in demographics, interests or life stages just to ensure that the advertisements feel contextually relevant. Non-endemic advertisers should never be competitive. The products or services that are being offered shouldn't pose any risk of cannibalizing a retailer's direct sales. And beyond selection, activation strategy is really important too. So I think something that holds true for all retailers we've seen launch into non-endemic advertising is that no one is looking to do everything all at once. No one is flipping an on switch that makes every piece of ad inventory they offer available to non-endemics. Um, they're carefully considering the way to bring non-endemic advertising into their strategy to ensure that the messaging, the placement, and the, contact feel, co the content feels contextually relevant, depending on where it's appearing uh, in the consumer's path to purchase. So I think on one end, you can consider the goal of the advertiser, right? Is that to drive a specific action on uh, the consumer's end that's going to make more sense for something like a digital call to action in a digital environment? Or is this more of an upper funnel brand building play that would make a lot of sense in a CTV environment or even in a physical store? So let's dive into uh, some of the many trends that are behind momentum for non-endemic advertising in retail media. I think it makes sense to start by talking about how retail media has evolved. The bright red circles here are illustrating what I'll call retail media 1.0, which really started out with a tight focus on leveraging retailers' first party commerce data to make ad inventory on owned and operated primarily digital channels available uh, with the aim of targeting an audience of customers while they're directly shopping with that customer. That enabled retailers to provide closed loop attribution to the advertisers who they were selling ads to, which were endemic advertisers promoting products carried directly by those retailers. But as retailers have become more sophisticated and identified new ways to activate the power of their first party customer data, we've seen an expansion in the space. So ad inventory has evolved from existing primarily on lower funnel owned and operated properties. It's moved off site and enabled full funnel capabilities. That's expanded the potential audience beyond customers while they're actively shopping with a retailer to consumers wherever they are across the open web. With that, we've made room for more measurement and attribution models. Everything from first, last, or multi-touch attribution, or even multi-retailer attribution, designed to reflect the increasingly fragmented path to purchase that we know consumers are engaging with. All of these changes have made space for non-endemic advertisers who are recognizing the power of leveraging retailers' first-party data to reach the audiences they're interested in. Switching gears a little bit here, 
This is survey data from the Association of National Advertisers, which was released in July of this year. They were endeavoring to understand future uh, ad spending plans among advertisers they polled who are currently spending with retail media networks. At face value, this survey uh, data paints a very optimistic picture for the future of investments from endemic advertisers with retail media. You can see a really large cohort of respondents indicating that they either plan to spend significantly or somewhat more over the next two years with retail media networks, and that the share of respondents who indicated that they're gonna spend either somewhat or significantly less is quite small. But if you take a closer look, which the ANA did, you can see some shifting when we compare these cohorts to last year's survey response. The share of respondents who indicated they plan to spend more is down 11 points over the same responses the year prior, while the share indicating they plan to spend less is up by five percentage points. I wanna be really clear. I think there's still so much reason to feel optimistic about future spending from endemic advertisers within the retail media space. But I think for any retailer who's thinking through their long-term growth strategy, they're going to be keeping in mind any signs of slowdown or fatigue among their endemic advertisers. And again, thinking through incremental strategies for future-proofing that growth. And there's a lot of reason to look beyond uh, advertisers who are endemic to the retail space. Uh, so this data is uh, from here at eMarketer, looking at our digital advertising forecast across the industries that we track. I've highlighted in red the industries that fall outside of the tr traditional retail ecosystem. And beyond some really impressive year-on-year uh, -year growth rates that we're seeing within digital ad spend across these industries, I want to point out that combined, these industries represent nearly half of all of digital ad spending, $136 billion in 2024 alone. So making ad inventory available to non-endemic advertisers gives retailers the opportunity to dip into the significant activity from non-retail industries. And there's a lot of reason these industries may be interested in working with retailers as well. So this is data from Integral Ad Science, where they polled consumers about where they felt the most open to and receptive to being advertised across a variety of different types of websites. Now, it's worth mentioning that consumers aren't likely to feel overly enthusiastic about being advertised to anywhere if you ask them. But shopping websites stand out as the type of website where consumers indicated they felt the most receptive to being advertised to. Which, by the way, Sarah, I, I would just say the interesting thing for me as I looked at that mm -hmm. is that, uh, well, of course, like all of this incremental ad spend from uh, industries like telecom this is where it makes sense to just reach people in a place where they're receptive to seeing those ads. And I would also argue about whether or not uh, do people like ads or not. It all depends. Is it a well done ad or not? Often they're not, but um, still. That matters you know, for sure. Right, right. So, but do you think ultimately part of it is just people are more receptive and they're in like a shopping mindset and therefore it makes sense to put a you know non-endemic product in, in a shopping uh, space. I think there's a lot to be said for that. I think if you're in a buy state of mind, you're expecting to be sold to. So ads are less likely to feel disruptive or jarring. And I think what's really interesting when we look at this data is to think about how some of this mindset might translate over to retailers owned and operated spaces, right? Um, if consumers are more open to uh, being advertised to in physical spaces as well. And I think something that will continue to be very important is just treading with caution as a retailer when you think through introducing non-endemic ads. Again, so you're avoiding anything that feels um, startling or like it doesn't feel contextually relevant to what you're doing. But I definitely think um, being in a buy mindset is one of the key elements that really stands out here. Uh, so what else is driving momentum for non-endemic advertising? We're gonna talk a little bit about the value of retailer data, uh, growth within offsite ad inventory and ad spend. And one of my favorite topics, the digitization of stores and how that's likely to influence the trajectory of non-endemic advertising. 
Let's start with retailer data. Uh, so the chart on the right-hand side is looking at some survey data uh, from us at eMarketer and our partner BizRates. Uh, looking to understand which retail membership services U.S. adults pay for. So beyond a retailer loyalty program and getting into paid memberships. I want to direct the audience's attention uh, to the top line, Amazon Prime. I don't think this is going to be a surprise to anyone who's tuning into this webinar, um, but it's worth mentioning that Amazon commands a really impressive share with nearly two thirds of adults year over year indicating that they're paying for an Amazon Prime membership. I also want to call attention to Walmart Plus. If you look at the results from June of this year, 26%, so one out of every four adults indicating they're a paying member of Walmart Plus. Obviously, when you compare that to Amazon, it's a smaller number. It's less than half of Amazon's share. But what really stood out to me when I was reviewing these results was Walmart's impressive growth trajectory. When you compare that 26% to what we were seeing last year at 14% and the year prior at 11%. Walmart really carving out um, a, an impressive uh, growth in terms of their share um, of adults who are paying for their membership. Uh, Sam's Club, Costco, and DoorDash, all worth uh, honorable mentions here with double digit uh, share of US adults. And I think what's very important to emphasize here is that this data that retailers have access to um, is quite rich because it includes purchase activity from these consumers. So it's going beyond intent and going um, into the actual items that they are purchasing. Something else that I think brings the power of retailer data into focus is that for context, if we compare that adult Facebook users make up an estimated 63% of the US population. Facebook, obviously a massive recipient of digital ad spending. So I think the trajectory of retail media has positioned retailers well in terms of their ability to productize this amazing asset of customer data that they have. And it makes sense that that appeal is translating beyond endemic advertisers into non-endemic advertisers who are looking to reach specific parts of the population. Now, I want to pivot over to growth in offsite, which is something that we're watching very carefully as we examine uh, the retail media ad spending. The chart on the right here comes from my colleague, Max Willens, who identified a very interesting tipping point that we're at here in 2024. So the gray line represents display ad spending on retailers owned and operated properties. And the red line represents display ad spending through retail media networks, but that's taking place offsite. You can see that up until now, display ad spending for on-site has really outpaced off-site spend, but that's all changing as of 2024. And we expect the space between the two formats to continue to grow as off-site ad spending grows at a much more rapid clip. So retailers are gonna continue pursuing off-site strategies as they look for more ad inventory that's free of the constraints of what's available on their owned and operated properties. The reason I bring this up as it relates to non-endemic advertising is that if you, as you move into off-site spaces, you're getting away from a little bit of the complexity that it can occur as retailers mull over uh, any potential impact to the customer's path to purchase while maintaining the benefit of being able to leverage that retailer's first party data. So I think offsite growth is gonna be something that fuels um, a lot of uh, non-endemic activity as well. And then I wanna move on to the digitization of the store. Um, no small feat, but we're seeing retailers here in the U.S. work hard to upgrade their stores to ensure that they're able to provide the type of digital features that an increasingly uh, digitally savvy consumer base is likely to be looking for. But another motivation for bringing digital services into physical spaces is unlocking some of the potential uh, that can be had by making digital advertising available um, within the space where more than 80% of uh, retail spending takes place. The chart on the right goes over sort of the diverse array of formats that are becoming available across physical retail stores. And I think one of the things that's so exciting as we mull over the variety of formats is just how diverse they are and how different digital surfaces in stores might lend themselves well to different types of advertising. 
Uh, Sarah, I think that's really interesting because there's so many different places, obviously, that are opportunities for non-endemic. But do you think anything has a greater opportunity than another? I mean, I think like a digital MCAT, for instance, is something we've talked about uh, having a lot of opportunity, but anything else? Yeah, I think um, when I think about all the, the formats that are potentially available in stores, I like to consider the difference between like a screen on a smart cart or the screen on a mobile phone if someone's engaging in something like scan and go and bringing up their purchases while they shop. And I think even an end cap lends itself really well to messaging from endemic advertisers who are looking to reach customers while they're in the act of shopping in the store and influence what they're adding to their cart. Um, particularly when you think about something like a mobile scan and go, a, a salient example is like you add pasta to your cart. Hey, did you know there's a sale on spaghetti sauce, right? Um, and being able to bring that really contextual, uh, contextually relevant advertisement from an endemic advertiser. But if you also consider things like the uh, digital screen uh, in an area of the store where maybe there's a longer dwell time and less shopping activity. So think about at a pharmacy counter right? That might lend itself really well to a longer format video advertisement from a non-endemic. Uh, another place in the store that I think lends itself well to messaging from non-endemic advertisers is the, the screen at checkout, right? If you've finished your shopping trip and you're, uh, you're going through checkout, I think the last thing you want to hear about is a promotion on a product that you didn't pick up during that trip. Um, so I think similar to where we're seeing retailers activate non-endemic on their owned and operated properties, that post-purchase moment. Um, is a great chance for non-endemic advertisers to reach customers. All right, let's move into some key takeaways. Uh, for retail media networks, um, one of the, the sort of most important things as you're kind of mulling over how to get into non-endemic advertising is developing a clear vision for how non-endemic advertising fits into and complements your broader strategy. Something that we talked about during the presentation is that no retailer is doing everything all at once when it comes to non-endemic advertising. Retailers are taking a very carefully considered approach, testing into uh, certain activations and evaluating how they're working before they expand. Advertiser selection is very important. Advertisers should be selected carefully based on audience overlap and product assortment at a bare minimum to ensure contextual relevance. And then I can't emphasize this third point enough, um, which just speaks to the fact that non-endemic advertising does not equate to easy ad revenue. Retailers really have to be prepared to articulate their unique value proposition to potential advertisers. There's a small handful of retailers that will be able to bring the sheer scale of their audience as a value proposition, but the majority of retailers are gonna have to think through what they have to offer that's unique from their peers, whether that's a connection with a specific demographic, uh, a regional loyalty that you have among your customers. Um, but crucially, this is going to be a value proposition and a skill set that looks really different than your pitch to endemic advertisers. And it's important to make sure um, that you're ready to uh, present that in a clearly articulated way. And then on the advertiser side, for any advertiser kind of thinking through non-endemic advertising with retailers as an opportunity, it's really about knowing your audience, where they shop, where they spend time, how their demographics, interests, and life stages line up with your campaign goals. It's about setting realistic measurement expectations. I think retail media is very well known for excelling when it comes to uh, transaction KPIs. Non-endemic advertising uh, in lieu of something sophisticated like a clean room solution is going to look a lot more like upper funnel uh, brand advertising. And then echoing point number three from the prior slide, advertisers should evaluate potential partners using a comprehensive approach. So consider not only the scale that a retailer can offer, but also how well developed the capabilities across their retail media network are and the opportunity to reach specialized audiences. I think there is going to be sort of a myriad of value propositions from retailers and all are sort of worth considering as they match up to your specific goals. Jeremy, I'm gonna send it back over to you. That was great, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's so such a fascinating world. You know, obviously, 
um, that we're living in. And, you know, obviously this is going to really impact the world of retail media over the, the next few years. Uh, we will get back into it shortly with a special quick take conversation between Sarah and our special guest, Megan Harbald, Vice President of Product Marketing at Sky. And don't worry if you joined us late. We will be emailing you a link with the slides and the recording of today's presentation after the broadcast. And a quick reminder that we will be taking your questions live very soon, so keep them coming. All right, Sarah, uh, back over uh, to both of you. All right, awesome. Hi, Megan. I'm so excited to hear from your perspective because I know you're at the front lines of a lot of these conversations. Um, so I think I'll start with... Uh, the fact that new opportunities, whether in retail uh, media or in retail generally um, or advertising, often go hand in hand with a fair amount of complexity. So I'd love to hear what guidance you can provide from our audience who may be at the early stages of evaluating the opportunity in non-endemic advertising. Of course. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, wanted to just kind of backtrack a little bit and give some context as to how I'll be approaching answering some of these questions. I think it's really important to understand that we deal day in and day out with a lot of advertisers who are testing and learning in this space, uh, as well as kind of helping kind of consult and, and guide the retailers who are looking to stand these programs up. Um, and complexity is definitely a piece of it. It's always a bit intimidating knowing where to get started in a new channel or a new ad type. Um, having been on the brand side before, I have some empathy for you and trying to figure out how to get budget for such a thing. Um, I, I think the starting point though really needs to kind of call back to a lot of what you were saying in your takeaways. You need to be as relevant as possible and truly understand that audience. The real value in taking advantage of non-endemic advertising through retail media is accessing these unique large retail 1P data audiences, right? So if you don't know how your kind of core customer overlaps with their core customer, you're not gonna be set up for success. Um, you need to make sure that you're doing the due, due diligence of identifying them and really truly maybe even rethinking how you define your audiences. Um, a great example is working with a mortgage company. Um, they really came at this from a core I know my demo, I know kind of those core targeting metrics that I'm used to on the programmatic side, but we had to reframe how we define that audience by thinking more contextually about how they're shopping for other products and where that overlap occurs. And what we found in the data uh, was this pretty over, like a very over large index of um, people shopping for baby products were also more or less in the market for a new home, right? Their family's expanding, they're interested in, or at least a little bit more uh, susceptible to um, consideration when it comes to a mortgage. And so not only do they understand who the audience should be, but right there, they've got a great kind of ad campaign in terms of their creative, how to be relevant to that shopper on an Amazon or on a Walmart um, and, and bring it back to their particular product. Once you have that alignment and you've got that core strategy, it really does come down to just testing and learning. And I think this is where partnerships can really help get you set up for success and get some quick wins. Um, the first thing is truly understanding, is this an incremental opportunity for yourself, right? Just because you know the audience is here, are they going to drive new and unique experiences uh, and engagement um, for your brand? And this is where doing kind of a holdout test, whether it's a geo holdout or a category holdout, you can kind of start to think about when I'm activating in this network, where am I getting the incremental value? As long as you determine that there is incremental value, you just move right forward on and start testing that uh, engagement, right? Where are you getting the clicks? What are the categories or the uh, shopper intent targeting strategies that are really going to make sure that your brand is relevant at the right time? I'll just kind of end it with, you mentioned kind of clean rooms and the, I think there's a very significant opportunity in terms of the measurement here. The beauty of retail media is the closed loop uh, nature of it. And so non-endemic brands really need to be thinking about how to take advantage of that and connect that data right back to their conversion goals. Um, so clean room technologies and having some savvy in um, defining a measurement strategy is a really important key to success. And that should be done at the start, not necessarily to come later. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such great guidance and some really good inspiration about the way uh, retailer data can be activated to kind of think creatively about what your audience might be doing, uh, right, that makes them a really great target um, and how retailers can sort of provide that. And I love the context, too, around what that testing strategy can look like so you can feel really confident in activating before you uh, go all in. Um, and I agree, it's so exciting to think about the way uh, that clean room solutions can provide closed loop attribution where we maybe historically haven't thought it was possible uh, within retail media. Totally. Um, we talked a little bit about growth and offsite. We didn't dive into CTV, um, but I will say that it's a, a very exciting area of growth within retail media. Um, it seems like CTV inventory uh, is sort of a, a sensible place to start when it comes to non-endemic advertising. Um, so are you seeing this approach with customers? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the major reason why um, is it's kind of like a natural starting point simply because such significant budget has gone into CTV over the more recent years. Um, in and of itself was kind of this new phase a couple years back. And so the test and the learn and the, the how to approach the audience strategy, um, it holds up to what the offering is in the non-endemic um, display world as well for, for retail media. I think the other thing we're seeing is you think about certain publishers like an Amazon who's pretty mature in this space, mm -hmm. they're really trying to make this as turnkey and easy as possible, right? Make it easy to get the budget, so align it to an existing budget that is already within these organizations. Secondly, how can you make very, very minimal um, kind of cost to get started? And so their offering is expanding to be not just programmatic CTV, but if you think about more of a sponsored pay-per-click typing experience, um, to fit any type of budget within your organization, to fit the savvy and expertise of whomever your um, managing teams are. It's just, they're making it as easy as possible to get started. And CTV is just kind of that natural uh, starting point to see very quick results. That's awesome. I think that really helps make it clear that this doesn't have to be a very intimidating undertaking, right? It's something that yeah. can be a lot more simple and easy to activate at the scale that you're comfortable with than uh, you might have originally thought. Um, so I think this has all been great guidance for getting started and, and making sure that you're set up for success. Um, I know for me, I, I love a case study. I think specific examples go a long way in bringing concepts to life. Um, can you think of a, a case study where you can go into a bit more detail um, from a customer who saw real uh, business impact in this space? Yeah, for sure. So we, we worked very closely with Yamaha. Um, to do exactly kind of this approach, right? Really, truly understand their audience. Um, they had a need to kind of expand their reach. Uh, they had a need to um, experiment with new ad types to get a deeper level of en engagement with that audience. And so the first thing we tested was Amazon sponsored TV. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, sponsored TV is more in that kind of cost per click model. It requires no minimum kind of buys to get started. Uh, and Ultimately, what we were able to do is tap into those kind of first party data audience insights, do the target, do the test. We saw pretty significant results. What we measured in the results, um, and again, this goes back to how measurement is so important and really truly framing the opportunity. It was a holistic impact. There was um, a pretty large halo impact on paid social. We saw an increase of about 55% in click through rate in our, their paid social efforts. 58% uh, increase in their paid, um, paid search click-through rate and efforts, um, and all while experiencing a 30% lower cost, like CPM, uh, as compared to their other CTV um, bucket of media spend. So just kind of validating that this is a, a pretty low cost to entry opportunity that can have real, real impact if you're thinking about this and framing um, the, the tests around engagement and reach. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I love thinking through and being able to measure that halo impact. I think that's so, so powerful. Um, okay, we have a little bit of time for questions left. So I thought it would be kind of fun if you'll indulge me uh, to do a quick rapid fire round. Um, so if I could list a few top of mind challenges that advertisers may have around non-endemic advertising and just ask for your very quick reaction. I'll be quick as much as I can. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So um, I'm an advertiser mulling over non-endemic advertising, but my audience isn't on Amazon or any of these other retailers that we talked about today. 
Okay, quick reaction, false. <laughs> Some more context. I think your data obviously highlighted the opportunity here, even just to access the Prime members. Um, the Walmart Plus members is very, very significant. But if you were to back that up even to, again, more of a reach conversation, 2 billion plus visits per month to Amazon.com, you know, that's just on-site potential eyeballs. Um, for Walmart, it's a half a billion per month. And, you know, again, 99% of those eyeballs are purchasing <laughs> once per month. Like that is a, an extremely loyal audience mm -hmm. that is, as you mentioned, right, primed and ready for ads. So I, I dare you to find zero overlap with those numbers. <laughs> Myth busted. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, what about this? Um, I don't have a spending budget left after traditional initiatives. I'm feeling very strapped from a budget perspective, and this just feels like another thing I'm being asked to spend on. Again, I empathize with you. Internal selling to get new budgets, not easy. Uh, but the good news is retailers are making this as easy as possible to, again, make it turnkey to pull from existing budgets. Um as some advice, you know, we did some uh, surveys within our customer uh, cohorts, and we also found that um, they're pulling budgets from like a paid search or from other display buckets just to kind of dabble, test and learn. Um, I'd say another kind of piece of advice here is you need probably about $20,000 for a monthly budget. You're trying to get to like that 1 million um, um, impression size. That's going to give you enough data to really validate and make the case to go get more budget um, and make that argument more uh, data driven. Awesome. Um, I already have too much on my plate, right? Like I'm balancing so many initiatives and projects. I can't possibly take this on. It sounds complex and I don't have the bandwidth or the resources. Again, here it's just, we retailers are making this as easy as possible. Um, if you've got the expertise or the partnerships and the technology to do pay-per-click, if you've got the expertise to do display and programmatic buys, this just falls in line with adding another line item to those things. I highly recommend, you know, third-party tech partners such as Guy. We're going to make that as simple and easy as possible, giving the tools that you need to make the case for more resource um, once you validate the uh, the value of the space. Awesome. And the last thing is just that I, my brand's not big enough to warrant spending here. If you're thinking your brand's not big enough, that's to me, exactly why you should be testing here. Again, very low cost of, of entry to see some pretty significant reach and, and pretty immaculate holistic results across the brand in total. Um, this is really the opportunity to give your small brand a much bigger voice. Um, so not an excuse. <laughs> Get out there and try it. <laughs> Megan, that was so helpful. I think that guidance is going to be um, so such a great starting point for our audience who likely has a lot of these questions top of mind. But speaking of that, Jeremy, should we go over to our audience for some of the questions that have come in? We absolutely should. We have a lot of them. So uh, I'm going to just jump right in. Uh, so first off, how does a retailer's market position, uh, like their customer volume, their merchandising, relate to their right to win uh, market share in non-endemic? You know, is non-endemic mostly just an opportunity for the largest platforms or can does everybody have permission to play here? Yeah. So Megan, I think you're going to have an interesting take here, but I'll take a stab first. Um, I think, like I said, during the presentation, there are a handful of retailers that have um, a scale that's very difficult to argue with when it comes to bringing value to non-endemic advertisers. But I would urge everyone not to count out specialty retailers who have very loyal audiences and a very deep understanding of specific cohorts and demographics. I think um, you could use uh, the home improvement category and how purchase behavior uh, within that category can actually tell you a lot about the life stage uh, that a customer is in. So um, Megan was mentioning uh, mortgage companies being potential non-endemic advertisers. Um, I think that's a place that could really be um, explored. So specialty retailers, I think, certainly have um, space to play here. But again, it's going to be about making sure your value proposition is very well developed, which I think for some retailers, uh, taking on that sort of a selling hat is going to be a little bit new, particularly since the value proposition is going to look a little bit different than when you're talking to your uh, endemic advertisers. Uh, but Megan, I'm eager to hear your take on that as well. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add here or maybe just continue to reiterate is 
you need to understand your brand and the overlap with the audiences. There's no need to take to even attempt to do this if you're not able to explain to the consumer why you're there. There is nothing worse than a completely irrelevant ad, even if you are more in the mindset um, when you're shopping to be advertised to, it still has to be very relevant. I don't think the, the market share or the size of your company really has anything to do with it. It's about understanding where the kind of target consumers you're going after overlap at that retailer, understanding their loyalty to that retailer, and then getting very creative in how you present your brand to them. Um, less about size and more about kind of relevancy, I'd say. Love that. Uh, so this might be, I think, a good question uh, for Megan, actually. What are the potential headwinds to uh, growth long term? You know, is the conversation around incrementality going to slow down retail media's expansion? That I think is really interesting. That might almost you know, be part of the argument for why non-endemic uh, advertisers are actually looking you know, for new turf to play uh, in. But, um, you know, could incrementality slow things down with retail media writ large? I think there's two answers to this, depending on which perspective. Um, from a retailer's perspective, right, the reason they're getting into offering non-endemic is to find that growth. And um, they're going to be successful in proving incrementality. They've got that first party data. They need to be as clear as possible with their brands, how the overlap works and give you the tools that you need to prove that. From an advertiser's perspective, you know, you have control over how you define incrementality here. Um, and again, that that formula may change depending on the stage of your brand. If you're really, really focused on just brand new reach, complete awareness driving um, initiatives versus maybe a little bit deeper into that funnel, more consideration focus, the KPIs you're going to use to measure are going to evolve. And so the, the value or the incrementality, like the incremental value, excuse me, is probably going to evolve with it. So it's going to be quite a while until there's just zero opportunity to grow here. Um, and I'd say the more data that comes and is made available to you, the more you're going to be able to find incremental growth pieces within this landscape. Um, so I don't see that being any kind of limiter anytime soon, um, given the buy-in from both sides here. Great. This is uh, actually going to merge two questions uh, that I think are going to be really interesting. You know, if you're a retailer, should you be thinking about non-endemic products uh, that you don't carry uh, that might be regulated, like alcohol and tobacco? What are the considerations along those lines? And then conversely, um, how do non-endemic brands uh, maintain their brand identity while leveraging the data and ecosystem of retail media networks? So basically, you've got concerns on both sides as you're uh, you know, entering this uh, new fertile, potentially fertile ground. Uh, so Sarah, do you have any takes on that? Yeah, I mean, I think from a from a brand perspective, again, it's about really thinking through how you're activating with a retailer. Uh, there are certain um, sort of reassurances that come with being able to ensure ad inventory on a retailer's owned and operated uh, property in terms of the uh, context that your ad is going to be appearing in. Uh, but it is a matter of making sure that you really understand the retailer's capabilities, where your ads are going to show up. Because I think it's I don't think it's good for anyone. Megan, you mentioned how jarring it can be for a consumer to see an ad that doesn't feel remotely relevant to them. Um, and I think that's, you know, beyond being not good for the customer, that's not good for anyone who wants a campaign uh, to operate well. So again, it's about uh, wading forward uh, sort of cautiously and making sure you really understand uh, where you're activating and, and how you're going to show up if you have uh, concerns on that end. Yeah, I would just add to kind of think about from the retailer's perspective, what types of advertisers it, they should allow in terms mm -hmm. of this non-endemic space. I think you you kind of touched on this in your data that, you know, it's about making sure that you're not driving conversions of product away from the retailer themselves. I will say there's some interesting things happening if you look at Amazon, right? And they have a program called Buy With Prime. They're just like literally yesterday, I think, announced um, some new product offerings to sellers who are selling more direct to consumer and not even, you know, selling on the Amazon marketplace, the ability to tap into the prime audience in the way that they accept payment. And if you're using that program, 
non-endemic display advertising is going to open up to you. So there's always going to be evolution here. You know, the retailers are need to really consider, um, is it worth kind of, is it worth getting me um, attention about the retailer, um, get that high margin revenue? It's going to be kind of a give and take. It comes back down to that business strategy. As a non-endemic, though, just be aware of what the retailer's restrictions are. Um, alcohol is a great example. Certain retailers may not offer any advertising in their network, um, making this opportunity maybe a little less um, opportunistic for you in terms of scale and reach. Um, but that is something that you need to kind of get into the details a little bit more on. Great. Um, we have an interesting question about implications for org structure. So maybe just one or two more questions uh, for you both. Um, there's a whole entire interesting question of more than just getting the budget to get started. Uh, you know, ownership of an opportunity is another big question I'm sure is on many of our attendees' uh, minds. So who should be responsible for this channel? And how uh, can everybody begin to tie together a strategy and execution across other functions or initiatives? So this is a huge question. It's hard to answer you know, in a sound bite, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna see if I can get you to both do it anyway. Megan, I'm gonna look to you to see what you're seeing kind of from the front lines of working with both retailers and advertisers. I think org structure is something that comes up so much within the retail media ecosystem in general. Um, yeah. There's a lot of sort of change management that needs to happen, a lot of upskilling that needs to happen, but um, where are you seeing uh, common pitfalls or where are you seeing uh, folks excel in this space? I think it's firstly making sure internally the powers that be, the, the strategy setters clearly understand this opportunity and are not looking at, you know, the word Amazon or the word Walmart and just immediately dismissing it or immediately considering it as a sales channel only. Um, the constant battle between trade budget, marketing budget and brand budget, it lives on. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. definitely always going to live on. But the beauty of the non-endemic side, I think, again, it's a little bit more obvious, hopefully, that this is marketing budget. This is an opportunity to just expand the reach of the program that you already have in place. And from an ownership perspective, you know, it needs to be very, very closely tied to whatever you're already doing in the programmatic landscape. Um, you need to understand, as we've said many a time, that audience, the targeting strategy, how your brand fits with those various kind of uh, key targets that you have. And then you just need to layer in that mindset of how that might need to shift or better align to a specific retailer. But I think it's a little, it's it's pretty clear on the non-endemic side, this is marketing opportunity. It should sit with the marketing team um, in terms of ownership and making sure that those insights are shared. Great. And uh, I, I think we have time for just one more question. So uh, Sarah, I know you had uh, talked a little bit about uh, commerce media, right? Um, you know, these non-retail networks that are cropping up. Is that going to be a major factor in, you know, just the, the rise of non-endemics and all those dollars going to retail media? Could that potentially slow down, uh, you know, this rush of dollars towards um, retail media, knowing that there's more competitors now? Yeah, so I think um, it's a multi-part question. I'll do my best at tackling it. But when we talk about uh, commerce media, we're referring to non-retail industries that are sort of recognizing the opportunity to tap into their own first party purchase data to offer targeted advertising solutions. I think two of the most prominent verticals that we've seen kind of enter this space uh, in a big way um, are the travel industry kind of uh, upgrading their offerings to make it kind of look more like retail uh, media and some of the successes there, uh, but also the financial services industry. Um, I actually look at this less as industries who are going to be in direct competition with retailers. If you consider what some of these verticals bring to the table, uh, they offer the ability to look at consumer purchase behavior in some instances across merchants. So I think actually they're going to be able to be uh, compelling places for the retailers themselves to advertise. Um, but I also think there will be some influence in the non-endemic space as well. If you consider the fact that barring some of the travel companies, largely uh, the commerce media uh, entrants don't act as retailers themselves. The advertisements are going to be 
inherently non-endemic, right? They're leveraging first party purchase data, but not with the goal of driving a transaction specifically with that entity. And I think it'll do um, some um, uh, good in terms of pushing non-endemic further into the mainstream in terms of a, a format for advertising. And I think that that's probably uh, to be continued, you know, a lot to, to see on that front. And uh, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today's uh, webinar. So I would just like to thank uh, you both, uh, Sarah and uh, Megan. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to the team at Sky and our eMarketer Studio team behind the scenes for making this webinar possible. As we wrap up, let me just take a quick moment to tell you about what's happening at eMarketer. Visit eMarketer.com to register for upcoming live analyst and tech talk webinars and sign up for our newsletters. And don't forget to tune into Behind the Numbers, eMarketer's daily podcast, which you can find anywhere you listen to podcasts. Keep an eye on your email for the link to today's playback. And of course, feel free to contact us if you have any other questions. Thank you for joining us and enjoy your day.